If you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. We are going to be in verses 6 through 9 today. And again, if you don't have a Bible with you, please use that Quebec Bible in front of you. It's on page 1139. And as always, if you need a copy of God's Word, we actually have some free copies on a back table as you leave the room. Please feel free to take a copy with you. What well, is so good to have you with us today. Um, you know, there are some weeks that a lot of things just come together. Um, not always preferable in how they come together, but just the fact that we are where we are in this book, even though it's very early on, that today's message is simply continuing in our series, Living as, in Exiles or Living as Exiles, that we are particularly looking at what it's like as exiles to live with joy in the midst of grief or pain or suffering. Joy in the midst of grief and suffering. And yet, let me just say right off the top, that doesn't mean we don't have grief. And it certainly also means that our joy is tinged with a bit of sorrow just because we are still trapped in the very nature of our bodies, which is decay. That doesn't sound very hopeful. You know, that would be great taglines for Milford Bible Church, a group of decaying individuals for the glory of God. It just doesn't, you know, the marketing tools would be terrible. There'd be lots of, uh, you know, zombie flesh falling off kind of things, which wouldn't, it just wouldn't look right. It might appeal to some people in our culture, but it just isn't the way to go. So we're not going to do that. But the fact is, is that we are living in bodies that are decaying. We are living lives where there is going to be loss. There is going to be grief. And yet, and we've said it over and over again, and we know this to be true, and certainly you hear it in good gospel-oriented memorial funeral services where we do not grieve as those without hope. And yet, too many times that hope remains just too generic for many. They just say, well, my hope is in the afterlife, or my hope is in this, or my hope is in that. The fact is, we have a very pronounced and very specific hope. It is not just gener generic. It is not ethereal as in just kind of atmospheric around us because of our community or because of our people. No, we have a very specific place where our hope is deeply rooted. And it is in nothing less and in no one less than Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ has removed the most hopeless thing you could possibly experience, which is complete separation from your creator via death. Because he's risen from the dead. Everything other than that certainly is overcome by all that he experienced in his sufferings in his afflictions. But certainly even to his own disciples, he said, you will have trouble in this world. I mean, he promised it. I don't like it either, but he did promise that the world was not going to like the fact that we have hope elsewhere because that compromises where they are placing their hope. And that's not to juxtapose us against them because we were all them, right? We all, at some point, whether as little children or even as adults, apart from Christ, we found our hope in what Satan said was hopeful, which was only complete and utter loss. But we know that when Christ came and Christ died for the ungodly, he imparted hope, hope that we could actually see the Father because he satisfied everything the Father requires of creators or creation to be with him. Jesus satisfied that on our behalf in his life. Perfect, never failing. Every temptation never tempted to the point of sin. Never gave in. We have. Even if it's just once, we still then, before a holy God, deserve death. And Christ actually then, what does he do? He dies on that cross, but there's no more unjust death in the history of all of mankind. No matter what movies you've seen or what books you've read, there's no greater unjust death than that of the person of Christ. Because even, and I don't mean this insensitively, but even in the occasion where someone has been wrongly accused and is executed for a crime they didn't commit, radically, amazingly unjust... But on a spiritual level, at some point, they were sinners. They did not deserve to die the death that they were unjustly given. Okay, so let me go on record to say that. I'm not giving specific examples. I'm just trying to think of the most unjust thing we could think of as humans in this world. 
Christ, however, was crucified to the greatest extent and had absolutely no sin, even in attitude, thought, spirit, or speech. In no way. There could not be a greater gap between perfection and injustice than what Christ went through. And yet then he is raised from the dead. We deserve that death. He did not, but he raised from the dead so that there's no other sacrifice ever needed because Christ has satisfied that. There's no other life ever needed to be trusted in, even your own, because Christ lived that life. The Christian life, the Christian hope is that all of our hope is in in an object. It's in a person. It's the object of our faith, not our faith itself, that gives us hope. Because when we go through great difficulty and grief, we are shaken to the core, even with the strength of our faith. And that's when we're clinging to the mustard seed type, right? There's just a little bit left. I I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm clinging here, God, to the littlest thing. But the thing is, even that littlest thing is a tether to the creator, God of the universe. It's the object of your faith that gives you hope. And that is Christ not the strength of your faith. So let that be an encouragement as you hear and I hope participate in this message this morning out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Joy and grief. Now, your outline in your bulletin is, is accurate. And so I encourage you to follow along the best possible. What we're going to look at today in light of this is in order to find and to rest and to be secured, so to speak, in our joy that we have in the midst of very real grief situations. We have to understand a couple of things. I think this text really points it out clearly. We have to remember what the cause is for joy that is in a sense outside of any and all circumstances. What is the real cause of your joy? See, that that needs to be somewhat settled, okay? Because I will say that the text brings with it a tiny bit of certainty, not total certainty in your ability to be certain, okay? Don't get me wrong, But certainty that objective truth is true regardless of what it feels like in the moment. So again, churches in Asia Minor are being persecuted for their faith, but they're still riddled with teaching like we have as humans, which is if I'm good with God and if God is for me, I shouldn't suffer all that much. That's just a human inclination. That's not an objective stated truth anywhere in the scriptures. But it still feels wrong to hurt when you're doing the right things. It goes against our theology, but this is where our theology has to have its roots somewhere outside of what we feel. So it has to be a measure of certainty. What is the cause of your joy? The second thing would be you have to at least have a general grasp. I don't mean be totally okay and cool with it, but there has to be, I'll say at least a very distant okayness with suffering. I don't mean passively. I don't mean fatalistically as if, um, you know, get up in the morning, stumble down the stairs, oh, I'm so glad that's over with, and you move on. Um, I don't mean that kind of insensitive, kind of fatalistic approach to life. But what I do mean is to understand that biblically speaking, there is a reason for our suffering. In fact, there's even a need that we have to suffer. That's a hard truth, but we have to be at least somewhere on the scale of okayness, of going, I don't like it, but I understand there's a purpose in it. And you've got to hang on to the least bit of understanding of that to really find joy in the midst of your grief. The last thing is, I would say in this, is it's really important for us to understand that there is a blessing then in our endurance. So if we understand where our joy is actually rooted outside of our circumstances, but then also understand that when we're in difficult circumstances, there's a purpose in it. One of the things that can help us along the way to stretch out those reminders of where our joy is, to stretch out the reminder of that there's a purpose in our pain, that there's a blessing in the endurance in the end. There really is a blessing to come in this. There's a, for way lack of a better word, a payoff. Okay? So let's read the text. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. <coughs> what is this joy in our grief? Well, look at verse 6, right at, the, right at the onset. He says, and in this you rejoice. Well, what is the this? Well, we've already been through that in the last couple of weeks. It is in the glorious revelation that Jesus Christ has given us a salvation that is merciful, one that we did not deserve, one that we could not have obtained for ourselves. In fact, he caused us to understand our need for him. He awakened us in our death slumber to see our need for a Christ, for a Savior. And in that mercy, as he interjects himself into our history, he has saved us. And that salvation itself is merciful. But let's not forget that the Savior himself is a merciful Savior. He did not save us to simply be in a position apart from a personal interaction with him. He didn't save you basically just to be religious. He has saved you to be in deep relationship with him, your creator. But again, make no mistake, as it said last week, blessed be the God. This God did not do that because he needed a bunch of people around him because he was just lonely in the cosmos. He's an infinitely triune, happy God. But out of his sheer love for those that he has made, to show his glory, for that glory to spread out like, like stars would send us light that takes thousands of years just to get to our eyesight as that spreads out just for the world to see, that we see an amazing mercy in the fact that he has reached in, interjected into our history, interrupted our timeline with himself, who is infinite, who is infinitely merciful. That's the this. In this we rejoice. We've been saved, which is a mercy, and we've been saved by a merciful Savior who is Christ. We've been made heirs, as we talked about last week, this inheritance that is ours, that the inheritance is protected for us by God in the heavenlies, but we are also then prepared for that inheritance, right? That's what we looked at in verses uh, 3 through 5 last week. We are being made ready for it as well. And part of being made ready for that is suffering. So the cause of our rejoicing is nothing less than a merciful salvation from a merciful Savior. There, are, again, as I mentioned earlier, has to be a measure of certainty going into the rest of the verses on this fact. Again, and that strength, the strength of that doesn't lie in your ability to be certain. But it is a faith given you by the Holy Spirit to believe against all other belief that what the scriptures have said are true. He is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. He has been raised from the dead. He has died in, on your behalf, in your place, condemned, rose from the dead, and intercedes for you at the right hand of the Father even now. Your faith in that Savior is enough certainty to carry you through what we're going to talk about. Let's talk about the necessity of suffering. If the cause of our joy is our salvation, then we have to understand that there is a source not just for our salvation, but a source in the preparation for us to be able to receive ultimately this salvation when Christ comes and we are taken to be in his presence. He says, in this you rejoice, but then he gives this caveat, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So we're going to look at some, I don't want to say word studies, but I do want to walk through this a bit slowly because first of all, I want to point out the fact that he does say there will be grief. He says that even if for just a little while you have been grieved by various trials. Christian, you are going to grieve. Look, we'll back up in just a minute with the other words, but I want you to hear this first. There is a necessity in our suffering, yes, which demands that we are going to grieve. And I think one of the necessities for us is to remember that we are not deposed of our humanity when we become Christians. We still lament pain and suffering. We should look on a world that is experiencing loss related to the fallenness of sin and all of its effects, and it bring a deep sadness 
not a rejoicing that people are getting theirs in a vengeful kind of way. You know, even when, I think, in many ways, I think you could look at our, our more, and I'm, I'm expanding what contemporary culture would be here for the church. But I think you can even go back as far as the 80s when AIDS really started to become more pronounced in, in the media and it became really known. And everyone wanted to say that it was the judgment of God. And it very well may be. In fact, we could say faithfully to some degree, it is the judgment of God in the sense that all sin and sickness in that sense is in response to sin in some way. That doesn't mean we're always, every time we're sick, it's a judgment. It's just that overall, we can see that there are small J's judgments going on in the world. But the fact is, is that we don't always know. There certainly are innocent people, so to speak, who got AIDS, who died of HIV before there was better management in healthcare. But you know what the church did beginning in the 80s so often? There was just a, I told you so, kind of mentality. A complete lack of lament of people losing their lives and the fact that people could be lost in darkness. And we could say that, yes, it began through gay and lesbian community and lifestyle or whatever you want to call it. But the fact is, yes, there certainly was specific pain and hurt that went on. But the church, in the midst of, yes, understanding truth and, yes, understanding that homosexuality is a sin, as is fornication and adultery, that it is absolutely sinful, absolutely but the church, I think, began to show her complete inability, I see in the large part, to really know how to grieve in a world where there still is hurt and pain. We think that somehow to be empathetic, somehow to show grief, somehow to show concern is to actually then endorse what someone's going through or the cause. And that's not the case at all. It just simply means that we are still human. Do you not remember that we have a, the shortest verse that Jesus wept? You have also the context of when Jesus wept, knowing that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Think about that for just a minute. When my kids come to me at Christmas, this is usually a long time ago, so we're kind of past the days where this would happen mostly. And if not, it's a warning to my children for this next Christmas. But basically when, when Christmas would occur and the kids and, and, and the dad is faithfully, dutifully hanging on to that zinger gift somewhere that mom largely doesn't even know about that you probably shouldn't have bought at some point um, along the way. And you're going to reveal it at the end. And it's going to be a reveal also to your wife and she's going to shake your head. But you realize that budgets get blown at Christmas and that's just what dads do. That in the course of this, that too often you will in the process see this disappointment on your kid's face. And you know what I do? In my great Jesus exuding kind of way, I'm just going, you know what? I don't even want to give them that gift. They're going to gripe about not having this gift yet. I just, I'm just going to leave it back there. And I mean, I haven't really ever done that, but there's a part of me that feels that for just a minute. I know what's about to happen. And I see them hurting over what they're not receiving. And I don't even want to give it to them. I'm, I'm hanging on to it. I mean, it never happens. In fact, I usually give Christmas gifts starting at around December 3rd. I, I don't hang on to them well. I'm terrible. They're laughing because it absolutely happens. But the fact is, Jesus going there to the tomb, even just hearing the news of the loss of Lazarus dying, he is weeping. He's not worried about the appearance of not having been there when it happened. He's not worried about that. But he hurts because other people are hurting. He knows what's about to drop. He is going to walk there and he is going to speak the words and there is going to be a guy, get up, a little bit stinky, be unwrapped and be alive as a result. And there's going to be a whole lot of rejoicing. And Jesus still has the ability in the midst of all of that knowledge to weep because people are hurting. He is the God man in a very real sense more human than any human ever to walk the face of the planet. We needed a sympathetic, empathetic Savior who would go through everything we've ever tasted, both in temptation and also in suffering, yet without sin, to be our Redeemer. There will be grief. That pesky, unfeeling, very harsh, calloused John Calvin says this, and I say that completely tongue-in-cheek because anybody that's actually read Calvin knows that he is incredibly pastoral. Let me read to you what he says about this text. He says, however, to explain the matter in a few words, we may say that the faithful are not logs of wood, nor have they so divested themselves of human feelings, but that they are affected with sorrow. They fear danger and feel poverty as an evil and persecutions as hard and difficult to be borne. 
Hence, they experience sorrow from evils. But it is so mitigated by faith that they cease not at the same time to rejoice. Thus, sorrow does not prevent them joy, but on the contrary, it gives place to it. Again, though joy overcomes sorrow, yet it does not put an end to it, for it does not divest us of humanity. We still must be those who care because we hate the effects of sin. We hate hurt. And whether it's a direct result of sin or just a fallenness in our world, diseases and other things that just occur because we live in a world riddled with sin at the very molecular level, that we have to understand there is pain that is caused and it should cause us pain. We should still grieve. But as we go back, he says, it's for a little while. So this is where we understand in your outline, if you were to look at it, where we understand that the necessity of our suffering brings a couple of things. First of all, it brings to us, we need it because we need a better treasure than what we're having at the time. Nothing begins to purify our earthly treasures than suffering and loss. Because something is taken away. It, it, it basically, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't grieve you if it didn't mean something to you. And that could be the plundering of goods or it could be the loss of a family member. He says it will be for a little while. This is to our necessity because we have to understand that what we're feeling the loss of is something that's related to a world that is not ours to have. It's not where our inheritance lies, according to the previous verses. And all it is doing is loosening our grip on hoping in things in a world that our tendency is to hope in. And nothing can loosen that grip quite like suffering. It is a hard, difficult providence. I hadn't planned on mentioning this, but I will just go ahead and recommend a book to you by a guy named John Murray, who was professor at Westminster Seminary for a long time. But it's, called, it's a little booklet, actually. It's only about 70 plus pages, but it's called Behind a Frowning Providence. It's more booklet than it is book, but it's called Behind a Frowning Providence. If you are struggling with God causing or allowing a great difficulty in your life, or perhaps more like me in this, I can be okay with what ultimately happens, but I can seriously not be okay with how that came about. He deals with that as well in that book about trusting the providence of God. Not just in what happens, but also the agency that he uses to bring that about. It, it really ministered quite a bit to us going through a very difficult time in ministry, but also ministered to us even going through uh, difficult times with family passing away and dying. And they are various trials. They're for a short time, but that short time could be your lifetime. Because on the scale of eternity, this life is just but a vapor, right? Scriptures say that over and over again. You see it in the Proverbs. You need to awaken. In fact, even Ecclesiastes, Solomon himself would say, there actually is more wisdom in going to a house of mourning than there is basically a wedding. And as we in our family have faced the prospect of my father having passed away a few days ago and be planning the, the funeral services sometime early this week, probably next weekend, I'm guessing, you know, we've had to be reminded of the vaporous nature of life, but also our hope is in, uh, not that dad is able to play basketball again or, or anything like that, although maybe that's the case. I don't, I, want, I don't want to relegate however God would cause us to celebrate in his presence. Nonetheless, I know that my father is presently with the Lord. I know my father is immediately in the very real presence of him. One day we'll receive a new body as we all will who are in Christ, but it's a very real presence that my dad has with him even now. And you know what, even as I was, and don't lament me for this, but, or give me a hard time for this, but even as my son and I were in, at Fenway on Friday night, and my, I literally pulled up my phone twice to text my dad a couple of pictures of the ballpark, and realizing there's no one there to read the text. That muscle memory of sharing something with my father was taken away. But, you know, I, it was so good of God that instead of losing, I truly thought there was no way I was going to walk into Fenway. I'd never been there before, but there's something, I, I remember when I went to Wrigley at one point, and just my first inclination was to call my dad, and I did. Because there's something father and son, for me at least, about going into a ballpark and just a, a romantic love for baseball. And 
And in the course of that, I just, instead of losing it though, because my son's there and, and wanting to, you know, him to have a great memory, um, I just couldn't help but, man, there's just so much, I mean, this is silly to many of you, but there's just so much better than my dad's looking at than the green monster right now. Or these beans that's really kind of in my way because that's the way Fenway is built. Just no good, no good lines of sight unless you're near, near the field. But it's just immediately thinking, this thing was short. These, these trials, I mean, yes, he, he had a stroke in 2010 that changed his life. Then he had a couple of bouts of cancer. Then he developed lung cancer. And then once COVID hit, he just could not snap back. And even though he was vaccinated, it certainly gave us, I, I think, in many, I mean, it's providential, but still some more days where he was conscious uh, just at his age and with all of his respiratory problems, it just, it, he could not snap back from it. You know, we, we don't feel anger in this. We trust God's providence that what it's producing in us is also good, even though my father has absolutely zero suffering remaining. He is in a really, really good place. And that hope mitigates our grief. But how unfeeling would it be to a lost world? Because guys, my father worked in the asphalt industry for 35 to 40 years. It was 35 years in, in asphalt sales, large, large plants that would produce it. And then really for about 10 years, spent some time in uh, retirement selling equipment with a friend that, that actually worked uh, on pavements, um, that kind of thing. So he traveled the country going to trade shows and all this. And I, I, I went with him to one of, the, uh, one of the auctions. I used to love to go to the auctions because even though we would see this big equipment, they're always... There are always, somebody was always auctioning off a motorcycle for some reason. And that, that's just what I was living for. I mean, even, even literally at 40, let's see, it was 10 years ago. 40, so I was in my early 40s, 41, 42. The last one we went to right before his stroke, um, it was a large auction in North Texas. And I remember a gentleman coming up to me and he pulled me off to the side. I didn't know him, but he was clearly one of those guys that he's wearing boots and he's got tattered jeans, but it clearly has a million bucks somewhere because his truck, his truck was ridiculous. He pulls me over by his truck and he just says, Mike, I want to tell you something. I said, I've been around this industry for a lot of years. There's only two guys that I trust. He says, I've been in it literally, his family's been in it for 50, 60 years. He says, there's two guys I trust. Your dad's one of them. And let me tell you why. He didn't even mention that my dad knew Jesus, even though he, he did. And certainly my mom would share Christ when my dad would kind of do the setup. They were a great one-two punch of just his kindness and his gentle giant kind of approach. But then mom would come in at 5-1, fireball, and just tell them what, what it's all about. Um, in that combination, loved seeing that there was this testimony. So when we have a funeral in a week, there's, it's going to be filled with people who are just these good old guys. Some of them are moral, some of them are not so much. And they kind of laugh it off because it's just part of life. That place is going to be filled with people who do not really know Christ. Do you know how awkward it would be if in our rejoicing, there was no sorrow whatsoever? It's one thing to know that there's great loss and that we still have hope. But it's another thing if you're completely uncaring, unfeeling whatsoever and just saying, well, it's just, it's just dust. God's given us this frame. There still should be some sympathy and some hurt and some grief. I'm not saying conjure it. Because at the same time, I told my kids, look, kids, you guys are going to respond differently. Don't judge another kid for responding differently. Some are just going to get very busy with Legos or toys or something. Others are going to just immediately begin to cry and, and feel loss and, mem and have memories. We all process differently, but there is a real grief because we are real humans. But our hope is the floor. And the cause of our hope is our salvation. And when we grieve the loss of another who knew Christ, that is far different than when my wife's father suddenly passed about eight years ago. We didn't have the assurance. And even to this day, don't have the assurance of where he was spiritually. And actually his death hit me harder than even my own father's because of the uncertainty. Suffering is needed because we consistently treasure things that are not they don't have the gravity for hope. They are in their essence hopeless. And that includes people. It certainly includes politics. It includes our health. It includes our finances. It includes a lot of things. There are various trials. We shouldn't denigrate one another if, if we think, you know, basically having a one-up. Uh, one when, when I was serving at our previous church, um, 
and we had gone through a, a pretty serious car wreck, and I, the back pain that I would experience was pretty severe at times, and yet, about the same time, one of our associate pastors was then diagnosed with colon cancer, so I, and he was always standing behind me, and I, I'm not, he, he didn't die, the Lord, so I'm not making light of this whatsoever, because I know it's a tragic thing. But in our deep personal friendship we had, I used to tell him, and, and I think he might, might have even one day from the stage in front of everyone, how much I resented the fact that he always had something worse than me so I couldn't complain. I hated that. It was okay. Don't, don't let it be too tense because we're good friends and he's, he's pastoring now down in the Houston area. But um, the fact is, is that we have various types of trials. God uses all of them by design to cause us to treasure him more to loosen our grip on the hopes of this world and to strengthen our grip, in a sense, on the only one who is the cause for joy. It's needed for that reason. And in the course of that, it gives us a better vision. And this is where it leans forward to the final point on the blessing of endurance. See, what does he say here in the text? He says, he says, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith. And then he gives this this kind of metaphor, this it's almost a metaphor and a simile altogether, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire. So he tries to take the most precious element that they could think of in this world, something they can see and feel and touch, and they know the process. Even the most expensive of elements in this world, the most treasured of elements in this world still has to go through a testing process. And so he says it's, it's like that. It's not that, but it's, it's like that. It requires a testing, a purification, and that's the kiln of our suffering. We need suffering to purify our faith, but it's not because it's just simp- simply strengthening our faith, although we need the strengthening of our faith. It's because it strengthens our faith in where our faith is already strong, and that is basically Christ. It helps you see better, and really I don't want to get lost here. I really, I truly don't. So uh, if you pray in like nanoseconds, do that. But the fact is, is that just like in James 1, when he says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you go through trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let it have its perfect effect. Let it have its full effect. Okay. So he goes through this and he basically says, then though, if you don't have wisdom, pray, pray for that wisdom. What is that wisdom that James is talking about? James is talking about the wisdom to see that what you're going through is actually producing something of benefit. So in a sense, I'm not saying, I don't want want you to hear me say two different things, which is this, that your joy is found in your strength of faith, even though he talks about strengthening faith. What I'm trying to focus here on is the fact that what is faith? Well, James defines that too. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so your ability to have faith is not like I'm holding on. I'm just, I just got to believe. I got to believe that probably actually isn't even faith by definition. To biblically strengthen your faith is to clear sight lines. It's to see what you cannot see or touch or feel yet, which strengthens the evidence of the object of your faith, right? So in a sense for the Christian, to strengthen your faith is just to see more clearly the object of your faith. Does that make sense? That's what suffering does for us. It roots these things out that we love so much, too much at times. But it's not even just in discipline. It's just in the course of life to remind us there is a drumbeat, there is a crescendo. We are all going to face the maker. And in the process, he is so good to allow and cause us to go through things that clear the sight lines to see biblically what is actually revealed in the text. That we have a Savior who is merciful, who has given us a merciful salvation, and he has secured for us an inheritance that is to come. Verses 4 and 5. And suffering reminds us of a future inheritance, that that inheritance is not here Our hope of security is not in our retirement and being empty nested and being able to have a house that we can go to that we don't have to bother with this or that anymore. It's not that kind of resting place. How many stories have you heard? How many times in the financial cycle in our country have you, have you heard or maybe even experienced yourself so close to retirement only for the stocks to plummet and you've got to work another few years? It can be gutting, but at the same time, it's a reminder. It is a suffering. Don't discount that. But it is a reminder that your hope is not in retirement. Your hope is not in whatever you picture in this world as being rest. 
you may not get it. My father-in-law, who was, worked for a defense contractor for 30-something years of his life, in the course, his desire in retirement was to remodel a second home. He acquired tools, some really great tools. Some are in my garage even now. Some really great pieces. Things that I don't even know, they look very manly, but the, I don't even know how to use them. <laughs> but I'm going to get them out. I'm going to make sure I, they go at least in the right spot and just, you know, make sure the garage is open. When of you guys come by and go, wow, some great tools I know. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> I don't have a clue. But the, the course, the idea here is that, do you know within just, I don't know, Jan, it was probably just months of his retirement, he's diagnosed with Parkinson's. And the effects of Parkinson's just took their effect over the course of nine or so years until he passed in his sleep. We can put our plans of rest in all kinds of places, but God is faithful to remind us or to gasp, gather our attention and say, I'm your hope. I'm your rest. It gives us a better vision for that rest, which is essentially what this endurance really leads to. If you look at, he says, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the sightline is to get from treasuring things in this world to see, to have a better vision that it's to praise and glorify and honor the Christ that's to come. The, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a rough kind of statement, but to say I'll sleep when I'm dead kind of mentality, in a sense though, biblically there's some truth to that. There's real rest for us is at the revelation of Christ, which is actually where he goes in these last two verses. He's actually just giving explication. He's explaining what he just said about rejoicing in the revelation of Christ. Otherwise, this would be confusing. Look at verse 8. And this is in the blessing of our endurance, that third point. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, if you didn't keep this in context with what was just said, okay, in verse 7, leading into verses 8 and 9, it would sound like that you really don't get saved until you've endured a pretty difficult gauntlet of suffering. Until you've suffered, you're not really saved and purified to be saved. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, in fact, it's really found in the key word here, obtaining. This means that it is actually, it's a, it's a hard English word. I understand why they put it in so many of our translations. But it's really because there's an absence of it. But I think our Western minds just end up thinking of this as something we obtain. But really what it means, what the word technically means is, this is something that was obtained for you. It was obtained on your behalf but not by you. So what this means is, he's saying our full joy is going to rest in the revelation of Christ, verse 7. And then he just explains it in verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, and this is where he's doubling down on the fact that suffering clears the sight lines, gives us a better vision for hope, the source of our hope. Because he says, he's reminding them, look, faith is you don't see him now. See, sight, okay? We don't see him now but you love him. Suffering is increasing their love even though they don't see him. Their affections for the Christ they do not see are increasing, but why? Because their hope is becoming more and more and more future. Less in the now, less in circumstances changing, more in the person who is coming and will reconcile all things to himself. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And that belief via the suffering, what does it produce? A joy that is inexpressible and filled with great joy. He doubles down with these words to say this is joy upon joy. Again, doesn't mean you don't grieve. But you're starting to see the benefit of having gone through such great difficulty. And it can help you endure serious loss. This is the long on-ramp that you would get with grief share. To share your hurt, to share your pain, to have Christian hope that is empathetic and sympathetic even to the lost world, but to sit there long enough, listen long enough, and really understand the hurt, but then at the right moments, trusting that the Spirit of God opens up doors and opportunities to share. But this is where the hope lies because we can't trust what happens in this world. 
We share grief with others that we may impart hope from the Word of God. And that honestly does come best through those who have been severely injured by this world. It's just the facts. So this blessing of endurance is simply twofold. It increases our present joy. And it also lengthens our future hope. You stop seeing it like, you know, Jane and I had to reconcile. We didn't know what ministry looked like. We had to reconcile years ago that maybe in what felt like obscurity ministry-wise that we were just to serve my parents. And she had to come to that conclusion on her own. And we talked about it certainly. But we both had to come to that conclusion, this may be all there is. Are we going to be okay with this? That, that there's ministry here, an opportunity here, depending on where this goes. And, and, and that includes it not having your own cabinets, your own this, your own that. Our hope is not in a house. Our hope is not in a job or a position or an advancement or a pay increase or kids graduating from college. Our hope does not lie there. Our hope is further down the road than that. We have no guarantees. Pursue what you'd like to. I just say make sure you pursue it in such a way that it doesn't crowd out the treasure that is only Christ. If you start to value a college education more than you value for your kids to know Jesus, you are automatically setting that up to be something that will be lost some way or another, either through disappointment or maybe not even realizing it. Not warning in some judgmental kind of way. I'm just saying don't set your own kids up to idolize something that will be hopeless. It could be the same way for job and advancement and any other things. I'm not saying don't pursue those things. I'm saying pursue them in light of your future hope. Oh, God, may it be, and I'm going to leverage everything we can in this world. If God blesses us with much, we're going to be incredibly generous because you don't take it with you anyway, right? It's the long hope. It's the future hope. And that is the blessing of endurance. You keep enduring the grief that you go through, knowing that there is joy in the salvation you've already received. It increases your hope that my hope only lies when Christ comes back. So I'll celebrate things now, but I'm not going to celebrate them as if it is my hope being realized fully. And I will also grieve right now, but I'm not going to grieve as if it removes from me the hope that's to come. Corey Ten Boom, whose book we, that Brandon is leading through, her own words, her own autobiography, you know, she's famous for saying this, that you can never learn Christ, that he's all you need until Christ is all that you have. And there's certainly much in her life that marked loss. It, if it could feel like, I, I can't believe another or you can look at men like Adoniram Judson who lost family member after family member while among the Burmese and sharing the gospel and seeing almost no fruit until the very end of his ministry life. There is real loss. There is real grief. It has a real purpose. Because we have a very real Savior who is our very real hope. And he is very really coming back one day and so the obtaining of your salvation the outcome of your faith what does he mean he's talked so much about sight what he means about outcome of faith is not that you get salvation at that point it means that faith again the evidence of things not seen he said you see you don't see but you love you don't see but you rejoice but then faith the outcome of faith is what no more need for faith because your eyes will see christ You will see Jesus, the Christ. The outcome of your faith is the loss of faith given fully to physical sight one day. And he is good and faithful to allow us to suffer here, here and now so that our sight lines are cleared to see that future hope of his return. And guys, that impacts. In fact, Peter, by the end of this book, that's where he goes. He says, as you remember and recall, when he comes, what should you do in the meantime? When the sight lines are cleared and you're going through suffering, you know what it does? It then gives you strength to be holy and to pursue holiness. It gives you also an urgency to share your faith because the sight lines are cleared. If we get lost in our own suffering of all that we've lost, 
We forget and to think about the coming of the Savior, and then we will forget about the eternal things at stake in the midst of our suffering, which is the souls of men and women right around us. Look, I know at some point this week, it's going to hit me more like a ton of bricks about my father's passing. I have lots of memories. I have lots of amazing memories with my dad. But for now, the assurances he just keeps using to get me through these days and, and to try to keep serving some, in some other scenarios and situations, which will also be needed when, when I go there some point this week to help with arrangements. And it will still be that long future hope that will sustain. But it doesn't dismiss the fact that at some point, you know, and, and in having done so many funerals and counseled so many families in the 27 plus years of ministry, I've certainly seen that those who really take care of some of the details, a lot of times they're left alone two weeks in because they have just deferred their own sorrow and their own hurt. And it just hits hard. And I always tell family members, stay close to them in a couple of weeks. Stay near. Stay listening. Because at some point this hits at the, at the most awkward of times, the loss. And I get that. And so it's probably going to happen at some point. But what I still will know is what I still know right now is the assurance that my dad professed faith only in Christ and there was fruit, there was evidence to that end. And that hope, at the end of the day, exceeds the very human real grief that we share and we feel. Whatever your grief is, Look, for some of you, you may be hurting in such a way that God is actually using the suffering to awaken you that you have literally been placing your hope elsewhere other than him your whole life. And he has caused you to get to such a bottom of the barrel kind of point that you are reaching out by even just attending church or watching online. Maybe he's an awakening you that you don't have a cause for joy just yet, but you can have a cause for joy if you will simply have faith in the risen Christ, trusting that you are a sinner and that he is your savior and he died in your place and he was raised from the dead, trusting that he has satisfied everything on your behalf. Maybe that's why you're going through suffering. Christian, if you are, please know that there are similarities. It's always to loosen your grip on this world and to strengthen your view of the Christ to come. And in the course of that, grieve really, hurt really, learn to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Sometimes you need to remain silent and pray for people to know their hope. But other times there will be the right time to speak just a subtle, soft, gentle word of reminding one another that there's real hope or they are truly in a better place. And, and, and don't make it too folksy, guys. Don't talk about just that, you know, he's fishing or he's playing ball or he's doing, or playing golf. You know, I don't know. If you've played golf, there's a hellishness to that game, right? So <laughs> don't make it too folksy, guys. The reality is that when faith gives way, it's not so that we see perfect shores. We may be standing on them, but we see our creator. We see a real Jesus. I've got a feeling we're going to have our difficult time taking our eyes off of him. God, we thank you that you cause and allow great difficulty and suffering in our lives to awaken us to our need to treasure you alone. Lord, if there are any here or watching that have come to a place to where they are realizing even this morning that all of their hurt, all of their suffering, it, it's, it's brought them to a place of realizing that they don't have anywhere to go for hope. And maybe they're realizing right now that that place of hope is in Christ alone, that they are indeed sinners. They don't do a good job being their own God and that only you can be their God. And they are ready to repent of their sin and come to you by faith and rejoice and know you for all eternity. If they are in this room, Lord, please bring them to a place of discussing with one of us what that means. Lord, for the Christian, and I would trust that's the majority of us here, help us to remember that you love in both discipline, but also just in the continual sanctification of our lives. You love for us to treasure you more and sometimes suffering is needed in our lives. And it's not certainly punitive in that sense. And it's not always discipline in that sense. It's just to be shaped and formed. But regardless of the, the cause, we know the result. The result is for us to look more strongly with eyes that don't see 
the reality that Christ is to come. And, and we can hang on and wait and endure until that end. And in the meantime, that strengthens our ability to live faithful lives right now. May this be the case for us, God. May we be marked by that as Milford Bible Church. May there be in us a, a deep, gritty ability to hurt with people while a tenacious ability to, with tears in our eyes, still rejoice, patiently impart hope at the right times, and to speak better words into people's lives in the midst of it. May it be done for your glory and your pleasure until you come, which we long for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.